Hello and welcome to today's uh, webinar. My name is Robin Dixon and I'm a senior viticulturist for the AWRI. In this session, we'll look at late season botrytis, the disease and options to control it. Uh, but before I jump in, there's just a couple of reminders. Um, so if you would like to leave a comment or make a ask a question, please click on the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar and type in your question, click send and send it through. So we'll be holding the Q&A session at the end of all of the presentations, but please feel free to send in your questions at any stage. So a reminder also that the webinar will be recorded and a link to the recording will be emailed to you and you'll be able to view it on the AWRI's YouTube channel. So for anyone who's just joined, I can still see the people rolling in. Uh, welcome. Today's webinar topic is late season botrytis, the disease and options to control it. And today we are very lucky to have a star-studded um, cast with us uh, on Zoom. So we have Dr. Kathy Evans, Liz Riley, Barbara Hall and Warren Birchmore contributing to the webinar. I would also like to thank uh, Marcel Essling. He is a senior viticulturist here at the AWRI and he has put in a lot of work in the background to um, get this webinar up and going for you at such short notice. So thank you, Marcel. So first up, we have Dr. Kathy Evans. So Kathy is a plant pathologist and associate head of research at the Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture at the University of Tasmania. Kathy contributed to Wine Australia's Botrytis fact sheets after various trials and many conversations with growers across Australia to understand the factors driving disease. Her next Botrytis project will contribute to next generation crop protectants through the ARC Research Hub for Sustainable Crop Protection. Kathy is also an associate editor for the Australian Journal of Grape and Wine Research. So today, Kathy will be discussing plant pathology and late season disease develop, de, sorry, development with us. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, Robin. I'll just uh, share my screen. And good afternoon, everyone. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Well, I have to start by saying that effective botrytis management would have started months ago. So today we're talking about that non-ideal situation where botrytis has appeared and might already be at unacceptable levels. And even if you've done everything right until now, the weather can still override all else. So today we will collectively give you a range of options, but you need to decide which of those will suit your operations because one size does not fit all. All right, let me shift. Okay. So our starting point today is I've got botrytis, the cat is out of the bag, and the fungus has escaped hotel quarantine. How did this happen? Is it botrytis? How will it develop? Is this block at high risk? And for management, should I spray? Can I spray? What should I spray? But there are also some tactics around harvest state and some other ways of getting cleaner fruit into the winery. Finally, we should think about what the current season means for next year. So here are some textbook book images of Botrytis bunchrot. We often see discoloured berries with a bit of mouldy fluff or perhaps full-on grey mould. Symptoms are not so easy to see in reds except when the whole bunch goes mouldy and when there is no mould we can um, feel the berries and see if there is that thing called slip skin. So this is about rolling the berry between your thumb and finger, finger and, and seeing if that skin slips relative to the pulp beneath. So slip skin is the result of the fungus growing under the berry cuticle where it chemically degrades the epidermis. 
sometimes it's not so clear if the rotting berries are caused by botrytis. And we know that there are other bunch rotting organisms. So it's worth confirming that the rot you have is actually botrytis. So if you use a hand lens or a dissecting microscope, then take a look at the spores. Botrytis has characteristic clusters of spores that are born on dark stalks. Sometimes you need to open up that bunch and look inside for the mould. So here's a trick question. Is botrytis the cause of this bunch rot? Well, the berries are discoloured, but from here I can't see any obvious mould. So what do you think? In fact, what we have here is sour rot. But I would need to be in the field to confirm that. And that's because sour rot leads to a strong, distinctive vinegar smell. And usually um, there are vine vinegar flies in the vicinity. So some of these uh, bunches might have a bit of grey mould as well um, and or other moulds. Uh, so it can all get a bit colourful in a wet year. So beware of diagnosis by photos or images. Uh, just by looking at the bunch doesn't always necessarily give you the right answer. So a quick refresher now on how botrytis develops. Botrytis has many infection pathways, but there are two that matter most for the purpose of disease management. These are the latent infection pathway and the necrotic tissue pathway. In all cases, botrytis infects dead and dying tissues. We are talking about a wound pathogen. So for the latent infection pathway, some people think that latent infection only occurs at flowering. This is not true, or rather, it may be that in your region, infection of flowering is common, but more generally, flowering is the first opportunity for infection, not the last. Infection can, in theory, occur any time during fruit development if the conditions are right. So latent infections may also accumulate through the season, uh, especially in cool, moist climates. But of course, you don't see symptoms until the fruit are ripening, uh, and when that fungus starts to grow after being in that quiet or latent phase. So this photo shows symptoms that might be typical of the fungus growing again after latency, but we also know that not all latent infections lead to fruit with symptoms. It's thought that excess soil moisture and high humidity in the fruiting zone promote the growth of the fungus as those berries ripen and lose those antimicrobial chemicals that are present in green hard berries. So the second main infection pathway uh, called the necrotic tissue pathway involves direct infection of the berry, often via wounds in the berry skin. And when we say wounds, these may not be visible to the naked eye. Thin skinned white varieties may have microscopic cracks, uh, powdery mildew can also create microscopic punctures in the skin. Really any little brown patch on the skin is a place where botrytis spores can germinate and they'll keep growing if the berries are soft and ripening. So a key source of spores for these wound infections uh, is infected bunch trash or aborted berries that have become infected and, and showing sporulation. The key point is that any damage to the berry can make botrytis worse, and that includes downy mildew, insects, sunburn, hail, and so on. Now, I don't know whether the fungus coming out of this berry split here um, is botrytis, but it just serves to illustrate uh, that a, a wound infection leading to mold. Now, if a botrytis spore lands on fruit that is leaking sugars and amino acids, well, that will certainly stimulate fast germination and fast growth. This list summarises the key risk factors for botrytis development late season. Um, I've covered a number of these already, but if you look down to the weather factors, the key thing is long periods of surface moisture on the fruit, any form of moisture, not just rain. And when surface moisture is present, Rapid infection occurs between 18 and 21 degrees Celsius, day or night. Don't forget the things that happen at night. So in short, bunch rot is favoured by calm, cloudy days with high humidity. To illustrate the importance of surface moisture, in New Zealand, leaf removal around bunches has been shown to provide control equivalent to a full season fungicide program. 
This is not going to be an option if it adds risk of sunburn or overexposure. Um, and uh, I guess Liz can tell you, can talk about the sunscreens. Uh, these can be used. So when we've been doing trials, our carpeting grower is often, often, ha often having a look at the disease level with us. And the conversation is often around the situation now versus what it might look like in the days and weeks ahead. How is Brochitis going to develop, develop from this point onwards? Now, if the mould has just appeared and looks really fresh, then the ideal scenario is a few weeks of sunny, warm and dry weather. In this, in this case, the mould can dry out, the rotten berries will fall to the ground and the whole crop can look pretty good in the end. Then again, the season might be more like this graph here, where on the 31st of March, bunch rot was still below 3% severity on average, but the crop was not quite where the winemaker wanted it to be. However, you can see the consequence of leaving the fruit to hang for longer. You either pick the fruit at the level the winery will tolerate, or you swear because the winery is at full capacity and can't accept any more fruit at this time. It can be very frustrating. So the, the disease progress curve, uh, like this one, can be plotted at any site. And if we have a few estimates to start with, then mathematically you can predict how this curve will go. The problem is, of course, that no one has the time to do the assessments, although one day um, I'm sure remote sensing and, and site-specific artificial intelligence will do it for us. And after giving a few of these talks over the years, people often say that their botrytis appears suddenly and very severely. And I'm, well, I never doubt what a grower observes. But what we see and when the fungus infected can be two different things. After infection uh, in the days or weeks earlier, the fungus might grow in a way that is not visible to us. But when we get those ideal temperatures and nearly ripe berries, then this fungus can grow extremely rapidly. Now, in terms of harvest state, uh, if botrytis has appeared and is likely to be more severe next week, then by all means examine whether an earlier harvest date is possible. If botrytis uh, is widespread across many blocks, then one option is to triage by harvesting your most valuable blocks first. And Liz will probably expand on the options for triage. So what is the effect of spraying synthetic fungicides late in the season if this is allowed? And always check with your winery. In this trial, um, Ipridine was applied at Verizon and pre-harvest, and then we assessed disease severity at various times. So the, the treated plots are this lower curve and the non-treated is the, is the higher curve. Now, I don't know if there was fungicide resistance at this site, but the graph illustrates that botrytis continued to, to develop with or without spraying. So the effect of the spray was that it took longer for botrytis to reach an unacceptable level. So it's effectively buying more time. Um, but do be mindful uh, with the synthetics. Um, if you're going to apply these, you know, are you contributing to development of fungicide resistance? So the reason botrytis keeps developing after these late season sprays is partly because we simply can't get good spray coverage after bunch closure. And I'm talking about for the synthetics here. When berries are touching, the spray droplets can't reach inside the bunch where a latent infection uh, might be emerging. Also consider the effect of applying, applying sprays to very mouldy bunches. It can be very difficult to wet that fungal mat. Remember that with contact materials, botrytis is still inside the berry, even if you do kill the fungus on the outside. And that dead tissue will stay there, uh, which is simply an invitation for secondary bunch rotters. Of course, it's your choice if you are doing this for cosmetic reasons and if the crop is coming off soon anyway. Now, others will be talking about biological products, and I don't want you to think that it is a waste of time spraying late season. We just need to be clear on when it makes sense to do so. 
Uh, at this point, you might be interested to learn that uh, some novel botrytocides are being developed through the new ARC Research Hub for Sustainable Crop Protection, which, uh, in which I am involved. Uh, scientists at the University of Queensland, led by Professor Nina Mitter, have developed a technology called BioClay, which delivers highly targeted double-stranded RNA. Now, this RNA is non-toxic. It stimulates the plant's immune system and it also doesn't leave residues. But you'll probably have to wait till at least 2026 uh, and beyond until a commercial product is available via New Farm, who are the commercialization partner uh, in the hub, in the research hub. Okay, so let's now look at a high, high risk scenario late, late season. So uh, in this scenario, you've either got a known botrytis prone patch uh, and or severe botrytis last year. There's been favorable weather earlier in the season, likely setting up some latent infections. We've got tight and crowded bunches, trash caught in the bunches, a big canopy and, and a crop that will be slow to ripen. There may be berry splits, broken pedestals and other damage. And the weather outlook is not looking good. So with this high risk scenario, even your best spray program can fail. In this particular block, for example, nearly every bunch had botrytis and the average severity across the block was 33%. It happens. And there's no point beating ourselves up about it when it does. Mind you, if this happened year after year, you might seriously question uh, what you are growing, why you were growing that particular variety in that particular place. So the final management tactic that I would like to mention briefly is selective harvesting. If this is being done by hand, then you can train hand pickers, if you can get them, uh, to leave mouldy fruit behind. Um, this can give variable results if the pickers lack the skills. The, other, the next option is an advanced pick, uh, where you might have two teams of pickers with the skilled pickers dropping mouldy bunches, then the rest follow. Another option is hand picking by dropping the mouldy bunches and then having using the machine to, to pass through. Another approach is moving into the realms of precision viticulture, where you might delineate botrytis zones and pick different parcels of fruit from the same block and put them into different wine styles. This, of course, depends on the spatial variation in botrytis. And I'm sure one day that we'll be able to use remote sensing and get a lovely map of that spatial variation um, of not only of botrytis, but of other bunch attributes. Um, you might also uh, have a machine that sorts fruit on the go. Uh, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Okay, so um, if the crop is machine harvested, then just remember that rotten berries tend to drop off the bunch more easily than healthy berries. This feature has actually been put to good effect by running two machines in series where the first gently strikes the vine to shake out the botrytis berries, and the second machine is set for, more, for normal harvest. Um, by, but if you haven't done this before, obviously test this uh, before doing the whole lot. Uh, just use common sense here. Um, the odd wine business might also be doing some optical sorting of destemmed fruit, uh, and some businesses might even use a sorting table for very high valued fruit. Well, I leave you now with the notion that it's important to make the decision to stop spraying as early as possible in an obvious high risk scenario. And you know things are bad when berries are leaking juice and being pushed off the rakas. In this situation, there will be more fruit breakdown and spraying is not going to help. Rest assured that nothing more can be done. Remember that mouldy bunch remnants supply next year's spores. We need to take what we can learn this year into next season because next season your botrytis management, management will start well before visible disease. So all the best to everyone and uh, thanks for your attention. I shall stop sharing now. Okay. There we go. Over to you, Robin.
Thank you, Kathy. That was a great presentation. Um, you gave us all a summary of um, botrytis um, pathways to infection, um, gave us some ideas about cultural practices to control the disease. But I think the key take homes were um, start early and uh, one size does not fit all. So thank you very much. Um, next up, we've got Liz Riley. Liz is an independent viticulturist consultant based in the Hunter Valley, New South Wales. She has 25 years of experience in the wine industry and has worked in and across small to corporate sized wine businesses and vineyards. She currently works primarily in the Hunter, but has a client base that extends to other New South Wales and ACT regions, such as Orange, Hilltops, Tumbarumba and Canberra. Her area of expertise is in pest and disease management, both in theory and practice. Liz is a Roseworthy graduate, Australian Nuffield Scholar, and was the ASVO's Viticulturist of the Year in 2017. So Liz will be discussing late season botrytis control from a practitioner's, practitioner's perspective. Thank you, Liz. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, welcome to the Hunter. You can see the beautiful Hunter in my background here. Um, yeah, look, I, we're obviously in about week five or six of vintage now, um, and we have most of our whites in with only a little bit of red to go. So for those of you here at um, 9, 10, 11 bow, mate, um, and you're getting rain, I feel your pain. We've kind of done that rodeo this season. So um, my talk again will, will cover some of that ground that Kathy's covered, but also, I guess, our experience with the biologicals, which up until this season, we've been in three to four years of drought, we really hadn't played with. So um, th th this is kind of, I guess, hot off the press. It's not scientific. It it's very much our experience. So there'll be a couple of case studies towards the end. Okay. All right. So as Kathy said, the whole of season approach really is vital. And I guess um, I'm in a region that's under pressure where, where we just take that approach. You have to manage it. Um, and I guess the bits that underpin it, I'm just going to go over quickly. You have to be proactive, not reactive, unless you're forced to do so by the weather. So for us, that means um, protectant spraying, unless we're in a situation where we get rained out and, and we, we grow out of cover and we've got to then do a um, post-infection spray. For us, prevention of downy mildew or control of it um, is absolutely vital and it's a cornerstone of our botrytis program. So uncontrolled downy, we can get downy that comes into bunches or we get dead tissue when a spore washes down from a leaf, that becomes botrytis down the track. Um, Flowering and pre-bunch closure sprays are absolutely vital for us. And even during the drought years, we still did at least one because you just never know when it's going to change. Um, spray coverage gets harped on about ad infinitum, but it remains really, really important. Um, and there's lots of types of coverage. A lot of people just go, our oh, coverage is about what you've got onto the bunch or onto the canopy. And, and yes, that's important. It's the understanding that concept of growing out of cover. So you might be at day 10 since your last spray. And if you've had 30 centimetres of growth, that's unprotected. So, you know, you can't just expect that that's going to be squeaky clean if you get a weather event. It's about using the right dose. So concentration factors, if you're doing concentrate spraying. And again, being nimble if there's a range of label rates. Um, you know, we have certain products that, you know, we had people using three litres a hectare when the pressure was really high and they weren't getting the control they were expecting. So you've, you've really got to, you know, assess the situation and, and make sure you're, you're using the right tool. Um, interval, as I said before, protect the unprotected and the right timing. Um, spraying before a rain event um, for me is, is really important. You can't just go, she'll be right, because if a one day rain event becomes a three day rain event, you really are in trouble if you haven't, you know, been on, the, on that protect and approach. Um, and, and you've got to have proactive reactivity. So if you're in that post infection period, don't wait, you know, the, the words that make me cry during the season is when people say, I'm just gonna wait and see. You can't do that. You need to actually realize that 
that the infection or risk period is there and get out straight away and try and gain control. Um, and again, you know, we had a La Nina outlook this year is getting in early, understanding that risk and working out what you can control. You can't tr control your rate of growth. You can't control how many wet days or access. You can control what chemistry you hold on hand, subject to how you finance that um, or what your reseller gets in. And, you know, some of you will buy a lot of chemical and you're actually in a position of strength with your reseller to say, I want to hold some stock and I may want to be able to give it back at the end of the season. Or again, as you see conditions changing and forecasts changing, be really proactive, order it, secure it, pick it up, put it in your shed. Um, that is something that you have the ability to control. And I think, um, you know, obviously a whole lot of chemistry is in short supply now. There's a few people probably wish they'd taken that approach. Um, so I'm just going to kind of work through, I guess, the, the business case and try to think about this not just from a pure what am I going to spray point of view, but a little bit bigger. So I'm going to run through this over the next few slides. Who is your customer? What are their specifications and thresholds? What does your contract say? What is your level of risk? Where are you at? What's happening with the weather? How long till harvest? A look at the options and, and then a couple of case studies. So who is your customer and how do you manage their expectations? Because it shouldn't just be a supplier um, buyer relationship. It should be a, you know, hopefully a, a more collegiate approach to this where we are all in it together. So you need to talk to them. Um, obviously a significant number of people I suspect today is supplying to the corporates and that relationship we know um, at the moment, you know, it can be a bit difficult. You know, it's, it's very difficult managing uh, with agility to suit everyone's needs. If you're an independent, supplying to an independent wine producer or to your own, you know, integrated wine business, you've potentially got more flexibility, but you need to be talking to them. Let them know there's a problem early so that there, if there's opportunity for change, you know, it might be picked up. Um, but you need to understand your specifications. You know, what's the rightness that you might contractually have or is desired? What are the condition um, specifications in terms of severity and incidence, particularly from Tritus, and also your ag chem usage um, restrictions. So, you know, sometimes the dog book is the gold standard if you're supplying. Um, for other people, there is more flexibility if they're not going to certain markets. Uh, and some of the corporates have uh, more onerous withholding periods than the dog book. So, you know, you've really got to be across that. Um, we certainly had some people this year because we lost a lot of fruit uh, to smoke in the hunter last year who were, became very flexible as our conditions deteriorated and said, we can't not have fruit. So that, that we had a lot more freedom to use things um, to domestic withholding crews, which that, that made a huge difference for us. But there were people who didn't change their, their intake, but you've really got to go and have the conversation because sometimes you'll be surprised what people will tell you. Um, obviously, talk to your customer about harvest methods. You know, if you're hand picking or machine picking, you may need to change how you do that. Um, so your conversation A will be, I've got a level of disease or I'm under pressure. Um, so talk about things like end use options. You know, we certainly have had a couple of blocks who have gone to rosé, probably nothing that's gone to sparkling. Um, one of the challenges if fruit is coming in earlier is actually making sure that the withholding periods from mid season get, get, meat, get met. There's a few things like um, switch, for example, with a 60 day um, withholding period is that you've got to make sure you still make that if you're coming earlier. Um, obviously the threshold for disease, you know, if you're already exceeding your winery's contractual um, point where they either apply a penalty or reject your fruit, you really have to have a discussion with them about, you know, how much more you should be investing in that crop or should you cut and run and, and exit that arrangement and look for another home for it or end use. Um, or again, a conversation about, okay, it looks a bit hairy on the vine, but, you know, we want to persevere and we might try some things. So, you know, please, please talk to them. Um, understanding your risk, uh, most of this is pretty obvious, but obviously you need to understand what weather's actually happened, look at the forecast, but we also kind of treat keeping an eye on that medium to long-term outlook. And again, this probably is a, is a bit like telling you to suck eggs. This was the before Christmas really looking at that outlook and understanding that maybe we were going to get rain and, and maybe whether there was more planning that you could have done or more sprays earlier and that earlier intervention. 
Um, growth stage, ripeness, bunch of architecture. So, you know, obviously there's some lovely Pinot in the bottom of the screen there that's a bit looser. You know, it's much easier to go in and um, manage something that's loose and a bit greener than managing the tighter than a fish's bum Chardonnay at the top of the screen. We're getting coverage is going to be a real challenge. So, you know, again, different risk, different outcomes. Um, we had a lot of downy in bunches, not necessarily huge volumes, but um, a little bit in a lot of bunches, which becomes a really big issue, um, creating a food source for botrytis. If you've already got botrytis, that changes your risk and obviously other physical injury. Um, ag chem availability and price um, is obviously part of the whole financial risk um, as well as crop outcome risk. And this year, labour availability and price has been an issue in terms of um, where you might want to do some physical intervention. Uh, weather and spray windows, again, you know, you've got to factor that into not only your chemical purchasing, um, but, but consideration of what equipment you have and how you manage your vineyard for, for access. So all, all things to consider. Um, so there are more options than just spraying, um, even though we'll continue to talk about that after this slide. Um, obviously, all the cultural practices you can put in place to help you manage, um, I guess, airflow for drying and um, canopy openness and exposure for spray coverage is really, really important. So, you know, this bottom um, picture here shows a block in Tumbarumba in all, all around Christmas time where, you know, we literally, you couldn't get your arm through the canopy is we had to go in and do really extensive leaf and shoot removal to try and make sure we could get that dry and get um, spray coverage on because we were just going to head for a train wreck if we hadn't made that intervention. Um, and labour has been really difficult and I think that probably cost an arm and a leg, but it was the only way to get a crop over the line. Um, you know, thinning of fruit, again, trying to get rid of fruit that's touching and sitting on top of each other. And whilst the challenge to manage berry size and compensation is you need to do that later, it, it's harder not to create damage if you do it at that point. So, you know, it's complex. It, it's not one size fits all. Obviously, um, there are times where you need multiple approaches. So it might be the leaf pluck, shoot removal, followed by, you know, some intense spraying. Um, we often get to the point in the hunter where we say the options are do nothing, i.e. abandon it, pick it or spray it. And, and sometimes you spray it and then you don't end up picking it. But, you know, you, you've really got to assess are you at the point of no return. Um, we had blocks where we had no access early in the year and that basically led to them falling over. Um, we had seven days of no access in some sites despite them being grassed um, and then it rained again. So, you know, it can can go pear-shaped despite the best plans. Um, really consider again that time to harvest and whether you intervene. Um, if there's more rain coming and you think you're only seven days away, that seven days can become 10 days or 12 days or 14 days. Is, is that thing you thought you weren't going to do, maybe actually you do need to think about actually making it happen. Um, particularly if you've got biologicals where the withholding crews are, are generally not you know, there, there are no withholding periods. Um, you know, it might still be prudent to put them on just to buy you that little bit of time. You do need to think about your spend. Um, you know, is the money you were going to spend on spraying or leaf plucking actually better spent on some selective hand picking, which might be dropping dirty fruit and then machining it or hand picking the clean fruit and actually leaving everything else behind. Um, I know everyone winces when we talk about hand picking, particularly due to the costs at the moment and, and the lack of labour, but if your back's against the wall, that may be where your money is best spent rather than more money on spraying. Um, and, you know, again, before you do anything, you've really got to have a long, hard think about whether that crop will make it. It's complex. The right decision depends on lots of factors, some that you can control and some that you can't. It's not black and white and different plans for different blocks are really important. So again, how ripe it is, what its physical condition is, how long it is to harvest and, and the value of the block all come into play. Um, again, if you can't get enough chemistry, it's like choosing your favourite child, um, you're going to have to make some decisions there. Um, so spraying, when you then choose to go down that road and that's the tool you've chosen, um, 
you've really got to consider whether it's conventional chemistry, biological chemistry, or other chemistry. And by that, the others, I've put Paratech and, and EcoCarb kind of in that category, and I'm not going to explore them a lot. Um, obviously, you have to work to your winery specifications. That's the first thing. But your next thing may well come down to what you can get hold of. Um, there's certainly very high pressure on the biological supply um, pretty much nationwide. Um, I've had a lot of people say to me, oh, should I use this or this or this? And I said, just find out what you can get. You'll probably only be offered one. So take whatever you get offered. Um, so that may change in time, but this year it's take what you can get and, and run with it. Um, you, need, you really need to work about um, when can you get on? Can you get the spray on? Can you get it on before or after rain? Um, we'll, we'll talk about for each of the biologicals maybe where that fits. Um, but I'm a big fan of go beforehand if you can and then follow it up again afterwards, which sounds like a lot of money, but the outcomes are generally better. Um, if you're at that point of being at 30 days, I guess the consideration of do you need to put anything else out? If you've still got growth happening, a bit more copper and sulfur might be important if that 30 days suddenly starts to become 40 or 45, if you get more rain. Um, if you think you're going to be picking early, obviously don't put those things in. So you've just got to you know, look at the big picture. Um, but also, can you get coverage? So right dose, can you get the physical coverage you want? Um, and again, some of these products work with, with these wetters that will give you greater penetration. But just for a little dose of reality, I've just got this little five second video that will show you basically the coverage we had um, when we put sunscreen out in late January or mid January, because we had a hot weekend. Um, and it sometimes reminds you that spraying is not the solution if you can't get it where you want it to be. So this, here we go. This is with a crop lands for anyone who wants to know. Um, and, you know, we really didn't see very much coverage on the back of the bunch. Okay. Um, so this is just going to take you through three or four slides about a vineyard I have at break or a client I have at break. Um, it's 25, 30 acres of um, Chardonnay. We had a really wet season. So from beginning of September up until the beginning of this week or late last week, we had 425 mils of rain. Um, you can see that photo at the bottom of the vineyard is taken in um, mid-December. It doesn't look that different now. Um, it kept growing. We had downy mildew pressure pre-flowering. So you can see here this little um, pre-flowering inflorescence had downy mildew all over it. Um, and that continued all season. Um, and that, w when things got post set, we definitely had some down in the middle of bunches, not rampant, but we certainly didn't have everything squeaky clean. Uh, this vineyard has had 12, sorry, 13 to 14 sprays. Um, we worked on a protectant basis, but had to apply some post infection um, downy spray. So I had a, uh, one metal axle and two FOS acids, which we're fortunate for this vineyard we can use. Um, but we still, you know, really struggle to keep things under control. Um, and I'm very happy with our coverage earlier in the season um, as well. So our early season plan here, um, you know, we were spraying probably at anywhere between a seven and a 12 day interval. At flowering, it got copper sulfur and prolectus. And then about 10 days later, um, copper sulfur and switch. And that's pretty standard for up here. Um, now, this graph um, is a little bit tricky to look at, but basically these are monthly intervals you can see along the top. Um, so from the beginning of the season, we had a bit of rain early and that created pressure. Um, you can see that we mightn't have technically met 10, 10, 24, but with dews and things staying wet, we had enough pressure to kick Danny off quite early. Um, when the blue lines get nearly to the top, that's 50, it's 50 mils at the top. If you can't see that, it's probably a bit hard. So we had a lot of rain through flowering, post flowering, and, and rain every week. Um, so the important parts are when you can get to the purple arrow, DGS stands for decision to spray. So that was when we decided on the 14th of December um, that we needed to proceed with one of the biologicals. And it took us eight days 
to A, source product, and then B, get a dry window to apply it. So, you know, this is where that forward planning becomes really important. Um, we then went back in literally a week or nine days later, and then um, subject to how it looked, we went again with a rov rule because we were able to, because this fruit's all for domestic wine. And then we got a lovely run of dry weather and we managed to pick most of this fruit, including some of it after another little run of scuddy weather. So I'll just um, take you through what this looked like in reality. So um, in mid-December, when we had that lush green vineyard, we had obviously these berries that had dead downy material. Uh, this one's hanging at the end, but there were quite a few that were trapped in the middle of bunches. The bunches were really starting to fill out here. Um, then we, between the middle of December and the end of December, we had 140 millimetres of rain. So these are like Michelin men on steroids. You can see um, we've got juice leaking out and a little collar of botrytis starting around the middle. So it's got the grey fur. Um, we did have some sour rot as well. And you can see as we move even from the 30th of December through to the 5th of January, so it's sort of seven days, um, some of that is botrytis and some of that is sour rot. Um, the botrytis though is not looking quite as healthy and lush as it was earlier. Um, and then uh, we put a rubber on at that point. You can just see over that next three or four days, um, again, it's there. But what we found was things weren't expanding. You know, where we had a section, it stayed as a section, didn't become a whole bunch. Um, and whilst that all still looks pretty horrific, you can see here now it starts to dry up. Again, the weather's getting a bit better. Things aren't as active. And by the end of January, a lot of this had dried up completely and mummified. Um, so, this was probably five, 10, even up to 20% of bunches. But we ended up when we machine picked this is all of this mummified fruit stayed on the rackus. And we then literally had bins full of clean fruit. So this is my first play with um, the biologicals and I was um, pretty stoked really. We definitely um, were helped by the weather getting better. But if we hadn't made that investment um, back in mid-December and the decision to, to apply a couple of those sprays, I really don't think we would have got this fruit over the line. Like it bought us time to then get to the better weather situation. Um, the fruit went to six different wineries and no one's rung up and complained. And I've had really positive comments about the fruit in bins and no lacquer issues from the wineries I spoke to. Um, so, this is a slightly different situation. Um, this is hail that arrived conveniently between Christmas and New Year. Fruit, again, around nine and a half, ten by May. Um, the weather was really humid and it wouldn't have mattered how many times we'd slashed, there was just moisture kind of coming from everywhere. So we took a really different approach here and we went with some Terratech, obviously a peroxide based product and worked on, we wanted to dry and seal wounds and we were quite aggressive in this. Um, we then followed that up a few days later with a um, botecta pass with a view that that might help fix things and, and hold things a bit longer. And then again, this is a vineyard that's virtually all Chardonnay. Half the blocks got cat tan and half didn't, um, depending on where they were going, um, which winery they were going to. And in the end, um, following all of those sprays or around those sprays going in, we've got another 60 mils of rain, which is not really what you want when you've got half your canopy and half your fruit zone. Um, chopped up. Um, but we got through all that. Um, the weather did get better and we picked all of that fruit um, successfully. It didn't look perfect, but it didn't have any issues in the winery. So again, this might not work um, if it was going into a corporate winery where they've got to kind of assess it and go, yeah, no, but where we were supplying independent wineries, it was fine. So um, I think if I had my time again, I probably would skip the Paratech and maybe have gone to Votectors. Um, but again, trying to get product between Christmas and New Year and a couple of days back after New Year was, was pretty difficult. Um, but my resellers were really, really good. Um, so the outcomes for us, the weather improved, the outcomes were positive, nearly everything was picked. What drove our decisions were that we'd already made the big investments 
in pruning and fungiciding. Um, we were really proactive um, in talking to our own winemakers, but also external wineries we were supplying to. We were proactive in sourcing product and getting it out. We, we didn't play the wait game, we just played the do game. Um, and we put out follow-up sprays if we needed to. Uh, it certainly wasn't all or none. We had some lower value blocks we chose not to treat um, and they looked a bit shabbier. Um, and we had some wineries who didn't give us options to treat. So there was certainly some negotiation there um, where possible to get fruit in earlier. Um, so my take home messages are, don't skimp on early season control. Bit of a moot point now, but do remember that for next year. Coverage, 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 can't say it enough. Please check it. Sunscreen's a great way to do it. Um, um, I'm a big fan of doing it at flowering. Go out and see if product's going where you think it's going before you spend the big bucks on those botrytis sprays at that time. Consider all your options, not just the chemical ones. Think about where that money's best spent. You know, there's shades of grey. Doesn't have to be all or none. Be proactive in sourcing chemistry. Talk to your winery. And sadly, as Cathy said, there are times where you unfortunately just have to take that um, understanding that it's not going to make it. Sometimes things just are ripe enough to fall apart, but they're not ripe enough to pick. Okay, we're nearly done, people. Um, the biologicals, um, they're not quite the new kids on the block. Um, they've been around for a while. There's been some trichoderma products floating around and, and we've heard mixed reports about those. This new suite of chemistry that the um, the bigger players have brought to market certainly have been around for a bit, but most of us really haven't had the pressure to use them. So the slides I'm going to go through here have been provided to us by New Farm Bayer and BASF. Uh, I'm not going to go through every line on them, but just a couple of salient points about maybe how you want to use them to try and get um, the best outcome, depending on which one you can actually get your hands on. Um, obviously, all the slides will be included if you want to download the webinar. Um, so Bayechecta, um, it works through being competitive, colonising wound points, so whether that's cap scars, wound sites from bird pecks, wound sites from um, downy, powdery birds, any other splitting. Um, so for us, this me, this was one of the products of choice for trying to deal with hail. Um, it's basically um, competing for that space in terms of colonising ahead of Botrytis. Um, and I'm not going to do that one. Um, so New Farm are really keen on you trying to get this on a head of rain event. Um, but if you have a rain event, get on quickly and, and try and um, get it colonising, you know, and, and competing with Botrytis. Um, what was interesting was how long it takes to be rain fast. So within 24 hours, it's not that usual when spray is dry. Um, you can't, like compatibility, I'm not going to go into in a great deal, but certainly um, you can't use full rates of copper with it. But by, um, New Farm have a really good list uh, on their website of what you can and can't put with it or where you need to have some intervals. So again, there's some tips and tricks to get to of how you use it. Um, so I'll probably leave that there. Serenade Opti uh, is a different bacteria. It is a contact um, product. So again, it's about coverage and getting it out there. Uh, it stops spores from germinating and limits mycelium growth. Um, th this doesn't grow or isn't as active as, as Botecta would be. Uh, so again, um, these guys are, you know, Bayer are suggesting you start using this earlier in the season, but if you're using it at the end, um, obviously, um, no limit on the number of sprays. Its rain fastness is maybe around four hours. So that, that you know, gives you a bit more time if you're spraying just ahead of a weather event. Uh, and Seraphil, uh, again, another bacillus formulation. And uh, they are suggesting short intervals. This is rain fast in not less than two hours, but again, it's very much subject to the conditions at the time. Uh, it competes for space and for sustenance and produces antifungal metabolites. So um, this is kind of, I guess, a dual action kind of product. Um, I really like this diagram and I'm not advocating um, Seraphil, but this 
I guess, thinking about the need to continue to use conventional chemistry and then starting to use um, Seraphil or, or for me, it would be any biological going forward. So I think probably what I've learned out of this season um, is that I would want to integrate them a bit earlier into my program rather than waiting until I'm at the point of um, chaos. Um, I think I would be looking at maybe at pretty much closing now, starting to mix them in with a switch or Solaris or Scala or whatever goes out for that period and, and trying to get um, some colonisation going um, much earlier. But there's much to learn. Um, and I guess just for anyone who's wondering about, do you make the investment, do I have to use it right now, is um, the shelf life of these products really is quite dependent on how you store them. Um, so uh, I now have a... Uh, beer fridge at most of my large vineyards where we were able to hold this product, you know, between spray one and spray two, or we've got, you know, a handful of product left over that we might be able to use next year. So you need to think about how you're going to store it. Do not put it in your chem shed and let it get to 40 degrees or that large sum of money you've invested will be um, maybe not so active when you need it. Um, that probably won't have answered everyone's questions on biologicals, but um, I guess my comment is, it over delivered for me based on the pressure we were under, but was well and truly supported by a change in the weather. So um, if I had my time again, I would do everything I'd already I, I did this year and put those products out. Um, I'd like to understand how they work more and hopefully um, there might be another webinar on that later in the year. So Robin, that probably winds it up for me. Uh, thank you, Liz. I'm just having some technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, another great presentation. Um, I really liked the questions that um, you ask yourself to help make decisions about uh, whether you spray or not, so how far away you are from harvest, what the incidence and severity of botrytis is in your block, the long-term weather forecast, the tolerance of your winery for sprays, um, can you achieve coverage, uh, and do you, you, do you have the ability to do the um, selective harvesting? Do you have um, access to uh, labour? So thank you. You also gave some really good um, case studies on how to use um, biologicals. Uh, so next up, we have Barbara Hall. So Barbara is a plant pathologist with over 40 years of experience in diseases of horticultural crops. Having retired from Saudi at the end of 2019, so last year, she now works casually doing mentoring and report editing for three scientific research and agrochemical companies. Her areas of expertise in viticulture include diagnostics, management and control of fungal diseases, fungicide resistance, and extending information on disease management to growers, lucky us, thank you. Uh, she has extensive experience in the management of powdery mildew, downy mildew and botrytis bunch rot. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, thank you. Whoops, the button moved. Uh, that one. Okay, sorry, I'm, where am I? Yeah. Okay, so um, Marcel talked, asked me to talk a bit about rain fastness and persistence of fungicides. So I'm just going to do a quick one th run through of, of some of the uh, things that you need to think about when you're thinking of these two. The first thing is the difference between them. So rain fastness is the time between the application and a rain event. So it's that early, you know, how long after I spray can the rain happen and I still get what's then known as persistence, which is the time a fungicide 
remains effective after the application. The rain fastness can um, influence the persistence. So rain fastness really varies with product. Um, sometimes it's specified on the label and I went through quite a few labels trying to find out ones and we're talking more the um, agrochemicals here, the synthetics. And some of it says, you know, do not apply if rain before product dry, which is the most common one. Do not apply during rain or if rain's expected which is a bit hard because when's rain expected? Um, do not apply if heavy rain's expected. So, okay, light rains are okay, one assumes. If it's not specified, particularly with synthetics, you need to assume that the product has to be dry at least on the plant before you get any rain for it to actually be effective. So persistence depends on the type of fungicide or product it is. So the surface fungicides are the ones I'm saying, just sit on the plant surfaces, easy like your coppers, your sulfurs. Um, and some of them light rain can actually increase the effectiveness because it actually redistributes the product on the leaf. Um, but most of them by heavy rain are reduced. There used to be an old saying with copper in, in apple, you know, for every inch you need to lo you lose a day. Um, you definitely, if you've got heavy rain, need to look at the shorter spray intervals um, because you are starting to lose persistence of the fungicide with the heavy rain if they're just sitting on the surface. Now, what I've classified as invasive fungicides is, is more the ones that are translaminar or systemic that actually go through the surface of the leaf and sit within the leaf. And they are actually protected once they're inside. So they're less affected by rain. I'm not saying they're not affected, but they're far less effective for the ones that just sit on the surface. It's pretty obvious they don't get washed off. The biologicals are slightly different. They're alive, most of them are a live product. So your Botecta, um, your Seraphil are live products and they're niche inhabitors. So they have to get on the plant and grow um, to be of any good. Once they're colonised in the plant, they won't wash off. The rain may reduce the growth, but they're there protected actually in the plant. But you can think they do take a little bit longer to actually colonise a plant. The fungi have to grow. So that's why protectors say two days, five days prior to heavy rainfall, because you've got to give those organisms a chance to actually grow in the damaged area so they can sit there and ward off the botrytis. The products that use metabolites, which is more like your serenade, and these are the products of the fungi, which are met met metabolic products actually kill the fungus that it lands on, or I shouldn't say fungi, metabolic products of the biological, which are often bacteria, just to confuse you and confuse me, um, they actually kill what they land on. So they're more similar to a surface fungicides. They um, are rain fast a lot quicker, um, but then they may wash off a bit quicker as well. So biologicals, I just want to say they're not a silver bullet. While they work very well, um, if you don't apply them properly and apply them well, um, they're not going to do the job that you might think they'll do. So you've really got to ma manage the risk factors well before applying. So if you've got surface cracks from another disease or you've got split berries, these biologicals need to go on before the botrytis starts applying because they're niche inhabitors. They need to get into those cracks and inhabit them before the botrytis gets a chance. Good coverage. I think you've heard us hammer that enough. Most of the biologicals will only protect. They won't kill. Serenade Opti does kill um, when it lands on it, but a lot of them will just only protect the invasions. They won't actually kill it when it comes in. So you need to apply it, as I've said before, you had a problem and you'll need to reapply them. Once is rarely enough. Um, you know, if you get a lot of botrytis in good weather and you get a lot of the biological working well, um, it's always better to have more and more biological to protect more and more because new cracks will appear and new damage appears. The other chemical or non-fungicide options that uh, Liz alluded to, your um, Paratech and stuff like that, they kill on contact only. Think of them as a sanitizer. 
Um, they wash off the surface infections of the botrytis and they may dry out some infections. I have seen some berries that are infected after you use them dry out and drop off. But it doesn't actually kill what's protected inside the berry. It's really just a, a sanitizer rather than a, than a killer. So rain fastness and persistence for anything really depends on the products you use. Um, whether they're a surface, whether they get into the leaf, whether you use an adjuvant. Some adjuvants uh, improve rain fastness, some don't. Um, it also depends on the amount and the intensity of the rain event. If there's a light rain event, you're going to have less effect. If it's a light rain event, but it's continuous over days, um, you can almost be as bad as having one heavy. So it needs to be looked at in that um, sense. And I really can't emphasize enough, read the label. A lot of the labels will have this information on them. If it doesn't, ask the rep that's selling the product um, to get the information for you because the companies do have that information and they can provide it. And if you've seen some of the slides that Liz provided, they're quite willing and ready to provide it um, when they're asked for it. And last but not least, um, this is a very quick presentation. So rain is coming, do I still spray? Well, you've seen some of the things that Liz has said about um, looking forward and working out what to do. And it really depends on the product you use. What's the time recommended, when you can use it, the withholding period, at what stage you're at, how much botrytis is there, all those questions that Liz and Kathy answered for you. How much rain is due and what's the duration? Is it going to be short, sharp and heavy? It's going to be long and, and drawn out. When did I last treat? You know, was it only a few days ago? Am I still covered? And then what other risk factors are present? Um, what other wounds, the diseases? Um, are your bunches really tight? Are you don't have good canopy management? Are you not getting air through it? Um, they're all risk factors that you nearly need to manage. And it's always better to do something than do nothing, but do it early. If you leave it too late, sometimes the better to do something is actually the conscious decision to walk away. And that's hard for anyone to do, but if you've given it your best shot, at least you know you gave it your best shot and you did as much as you could, and it's just bloody mother nature strikes again. Thank you. Exit. <laughs> Never quite sure how to get out of this. That's the only problem. Thank you, Barbara. Um, thank you. That was that was wonderful. I think, but in a different way. Start early. Coverage is essential, and know know the product um, that you're trying to apply, so you can get the best results out of it. And yeah, understand your risk. Um, so thank you. Now, um, as well as um, keeping Kathy, Barbara um, and Liz uh, online, um, we would like to invite Warren Birchmore to join us um, for the panel discussion. So while um, I'm introducing Warren, uh, if everyone can have, all the uh, panelists can have their microphones off of mute and their uh, videos on, please, Warren. Um, if you have any questions, just a reminder that um, you can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A button that's down the bottom of the Zoom um, panel. So just type your question and press send uh, and we're, we will ask the panelists. Um, Thank you. So we have, thank you, Warren. Good to see you. Um, first off, we have a question for Liz. So with the end of season sprays um, you talked about, um, are, are they bunch directed spray, sprays or whole canopy sprays? Um, so for all the spraying we did still in December because we had a heap of rain coming. So mid-December was still full canopy because we put copper and sulfur with the serenade that we put out. 
um, and the spraying that we did with Paratec was whole of canopy because again, we were um, trying to gain a bit of downy control as well as um, clean up our hail wounds. So we went the top rate there um, and went full canopy. Uh, and then the stuff we did after, it was just, for us, it was too hard to try and collect up sprayers. So we, we've gone whole canopy. Um, but, you know, and also I have a couple of vineyards where they're not flat. We have, I wouldn't call it terracing, but it's on hills. So to collect stuff up means we just don't get the coverage right. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a, a question here say, for Liz as well saying, do you ever think it's too hard to grow grapes successfully and profitably in the Hunter and uh, similar regions? Uh, I think if you're not in the value chain, yeah, it's very questionable. Um, I have a whole lot of lawyers, doctors, whatever's out of Sydney who all have the dream of having a vineyard. And when, when you put the numbers in front of them in the first year, they go, no, no, that's, that's okay. And then they realise that that's not okay. It's not sustainable. So increasingly we're seeing wine businesses partnering with people and, and more integrated management and, and relationships. So, um, yeah, look, no, I don't, I don't think it is all the time, no. Thank you. Uh, this is a question for Cathy. Um, so you spoke in your presentation about the importance of flowering sprays and really um, Liz and Barbara spoke about early intervention as well. Um, do you have um, any trial results showing um, the uh, effect of flowering botrytis sprays on the late season botrytis um, levels, if you've had a really challenging year, so um, a trial with and without flowering sprays. Yeah, thanks, Robin. It's it's a good question, and I guess the short answer is we we never really know when that infection is occurring. Um, so I'll give you give you an example. I'll talk about the trial uh, some trial results in a minute, but working with one particular grower and we were looking at the weather conditions during flowering and he said, oh, look, it's, it's really dry. I, I don't expect there would have been any latent infections this season. Um, at, but then when we looked at the weather, uh, the, ind the weather index we were using was actually accumulating and, and using a thing called um, early season botrytis risk, which is something implemented in New Zealand. The index said it predicted it would be worse than 3% severity at harvest. And sure enough, it was. So the infections at flowering, um, even though it seemed dry, there were sources of moisture in that particular block that were allowing uh, infections during flowering. Having said that, uh, whether the flowering spray or, the, or flowering or later season is more important, the only way you can really answer that question is to do a, a, a spray trial where you do different timings and it's going to vary from one region to another. So in, in Tasmania, so, and I can really only answer this question from a cool climate perspective because they're the only trials we have. Um, so down, down here, for example, we've actually found uh, uh, one spray at pre-bunch closure was more effective than just doing one spray at flowering. Um, and that was that was using growers' equipment over over a whole block. It's published in the Australian Journal of Grape and Wine Research, 2011. Bramley Evans et al. Um, so you know, in that at that site, the later spray was more effective. But you know, again, we don't know when the infection is occurring. Wayne Wilcox in New York State, um, he's shown that sometimes the flowering sprays are more important then the later sprays, sometimes the later sprays are more important. So it, it's still something that um, is, is challenging, challenging to have a, you know, it, it depends on your site, it depends on the season. It's very, a very weather driven process is the long answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Liz or Barbara or even Warren, do you have anything to add um, to Cathy's answer? No, she yeah. answered it pretty well. Robin, um, 
from from trial work that we've done in South Australia, both in um, like Barossa and Riverland and such like that, we've definitely got very good data to show that the flowering spray works exceptionally well. Um, if if you have one or two rain events at harvest. So, so much of what you do earlier depends on your rain events at harvest. I know this is true, but we don't all have crystal balls. It'd be so much nicer if we did, that we knew exactly how much rain was going to come and when, because are you risking not putting the flowering spray on? Because your first rain event at harvest shows you how good your flowering spray was and, and how well you protected your latent infection. Um, and I'm saying flowering as in flowering to pre-brunch closure. I'm using that sort of collectively, not just the pure flowering spray, but that early synthetic latent control um, feeds how good you are after the first rain event. And I'm talking heavy rain event here. Uh, yeah, and, and look, to back that up, we don't see a lot of what I would consider latent infection, you know, and that's because we're putting those that chemistry out through that window. Yeah. The bulk of what I've seen at the end has been mechanical. So it's either bird injury or super tight bunches where the berries have just pulled off the rackets and there's wet, sweet juice and it's hot and humid. You know, why wouldn't the tribes grow on that? Yeah. So what what so we sort of looked looked at it always as the first rain event was your flowering spray control, the second rain event and maybe the third was your canopy management control, and your fourth rain event you were stuffed. And so if you hadn't had everything, all your ducks in line by the forced rain event and everything off, really whatever you've done before um, isn't as important as perhaps you. And this is why we all of us say botrytis management is a whole of program management. You can't just rely on one thing to manage it. It's everything acting together. Yeah. So I did leaf plucking for the first time ever in the Hunter. Um, on the same vineyard where I used the serenade. Um, and we had to go in like Kathy showed. We, we did that and that made a huge difference to us. Again, getting spray coverage, airflow dry, but we had to go in with sunscreen for literally three days, you know, to get that coverage for three mm. days. It was so open. So, you know, it, I felt like it kept costing and costing and costing, but that was some of my highest value Chardonnay. So um, it, it wasn't replaceable and this vineyard lost all its fruit to smoke last year. So they needed for it to go into their brand. So it, it was palatable across the, the value chain rather than purely as going through. So it's really about you know protecting protecting against your late infections and then other things just make it worse um, yeah. as, as you go yeah. along. So it you know it's all cumulative. <laughs> okay. Um, Liz, do you have any thoughts on uh, the comment about not having a, a crystal ball? to um, to know what the yeah look i guess we assume that it's going to rain um last year in the drought i guess we got a little bit you know more excited and we were able to stop spraying at christmas time for the first time ever but when, when there's a la nina outlook i think we just assume the worst and hope for the best so th th that's kind of i guess my approach to the crystal ball um i can wind it back but i can't put it on and wish i'd done it yeah, so you're looking at long-term um, uh, bomb forecasts, the climate outlook. Um, well, yeah, look, you know, watching those monthly outlook videos that the Bureau put out, we also now DPI in New South Wales um, buy some weather um, forecasting on a monthly basis for New South Wales. So if anyone in New South Wales doesn't get that, they need to subscribe to the Vine Watch newsletter. And that gives us um, likelihood of, 25 or 50 mils in that month. And then the Bureau put a confidence factor at the end of that. And that's been really, really useful. So when they say there's a very high chance of 50 mils or 100 mils and the confidence is high, you can go out and buy stuff. Versus if it says 50 mils, uh, 50 mils likelihood is high, likelihood is high, and then the confidence is low, you go, oh, they really don't know. And I don't mind them not knowing. I like knowing that they don't know, because then I can go, well, maybe I'll buy enough for half of the vineyard. Um, so it just helps me work out where my risk, you know, where I want to draw that line, you know. Okay, great, thank you. We've had quite a few questions come through for you, Liz. Um, so, uh, 
when you used Botect, Botecta, was that uh, because it was the only biological available or was it the preferred option? And if it was preferred, why was that? Um, look, I, I have quite good engagement with the new fungi in New South Wales and we've been having a conversation with them about hail. Um, so it was my preferred product at the time um, and we had really good availability of that. So um, that, that was the driver for that one, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. And for you, Barb, a question that came through about Serenade. Um, so uh, did they understand correctly that Serenade kills detritus, but the others, Protector and Seraphel, do not? Um, is that correct, that the later, latter two outcompete Botrytis? Um, the latter two, the Botector and... Um, um, Seraphil are niche inhabitants. And so they're a product that actually grows where the botrytis would normally grow and tries to outcompete it. What Serenade Opti have done has been slightly different. They've actually um, taken the metabolites that these um, products, because Seraphil also has that, they have the metabolic thing that happens with the live organism. They've taken the metabolites and, and produced them into a, essentially a fungicide. Um, and yes, it will kill spores on contact um, and it will kill spores while it's still active, it will kill spores that land on it. Um, but it, they still say it's best to provide as a protectant because it, it will only kill a spore it lands on. So if you don't have 100% coverage, you're not getting complete kill. So it's never, even though, yes, it does kill the spores, it's not advisable to use it as an eradicant. Um, because it just won't be as effective because of the coverage issue, especially late season. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Another question for you, Liz. Um, so given the cost of biologicals, the biggest obstacles uh, this participant has in the field are uh, the cost of the product and reactivity. So I guess um, how long it takes them to get out there and spray it. Um, so do you have any, uh, any thoughts on how you can accurately measure the cost versus gain um, of using these products? Um, and do you have any thoughts on how you can um, convince growers to um, put the sprays on. Um, so I, I guess the question is, um, any any tips on navigating the battleground between best yeah. practice and maximizing yeah. returns? Look, it, it's really difficult. I, I think for me, you, you've got to have a go. Um, again, you don't have to do your whole vineyard, you don't have to do every variety, but do an area. You know, split a box with your neighbor if that's how you have to skin the cat to buy it, and not you know, expose yourself to a big spend, but do a bit and do it and don't do another bit. Um, you know, you, you've got to have a go. And if the difference is your unsprayed area gets rejected or, you know, downgraded versus your other stuff makes it, that, that's, the, that's the ultimate outcome. Um, and I guess the, the bit with none of us have really explored, and I guess this will be the next 12 months, is do we have less of a carryover? Don't know. Um, so, you know, it's, it's working out, you know, the, the reality is there aren't too many other options. So we've all got to get our head around it pretty quickly and, and work out how you make it work. So, you know, have a go. Yeah. Okay. Um, to probably Barbara and Liz, have you had any experience with trichoderma? I'll take that one, Barb. Um, all I yours. <laughs> um, I hadn't until um, this year. There, there's always been lots of folklore in the hunter at work that doesn't work. Um, we do have one video where we put it out um, again very early. Just you know, we were looking, looking, and looking, and found some botrytis, um, and it became down to one variety got serenade, one variety got um, antagonizer, one variety got protecta, literally because that was giving up what was available. Um, we were very, very pleased with the results with the trichoderma this year. But I, again, I think it was timing the product literally being able to go on the next day um, and the weather getting better. So uh, I was very impressed. But again, it was just 
I think serendipity. I think maybe if I'd had um, to wait a week with that, I don't know if that would have delivered. My ex most of my experience with trichoderma has actually been in other crops. Um, and my experience is sometimes it works exceptionally well and sometimes it doesn't. And I think depending on the product, and, and I mean, this was a few years ago, so, so whether the products have been developed a bit better, I think they're, they were at one stage a bit more reactive to the environment some, than some of the newer products that seem to be able to cope and have been developed to cope with a much wider range of conditions. Um, so there are a lot of good trichoderma products out there, but there seems to be, it, it seems to have a bit narrower window when you can effectively use them. And hopefully some of the newer um, ones coming out will, will address that. Great, thank you. Um, another question, perhaps um, for Cathy, um, given um, the severe, well, the potential for severe infection this year due to the rain events, how do we minimise the carryover into um, subsequent years and is there carryover? Um, first of all, I'd have a really good diagnosis of, of the things that were driving your disease levels this year. So, um, you know, a simple one is we talked about wounds making botrytis worse. So um, it was your powdery mildew control uh, what it should be. Uh, maybe it's as simple as paying attention to something else. You know, what was the most limiting factor? Um, well, and, and were they factors within your control or not within your control? I mean, berry splits are a, are, are a weather, you know, a rainfall thing, um, you know, but, but sometimes it's, the, you know, the way crops are watered or whatever. You know, have a think about what was really driving that epidemic. Now, if there's a big carryover of, of spores and, and mostly the load of spores is going to be within the canopy itself, you know, the bunch remnants and, and so, you know, what, whatever's left in that canopy. Um, then again, it's thinking about, well, if I didn't do an 80% flowering spray this year, you know, this is the year, next year is the year to start early and get, get, that, get those sprays on and, and think about the way you're managing the canopy. We haven't talked a lot about canopy management. Um, do you need to also think about uh, pruning, you know, having a lighter crop, not such a big crop? You know, there's a lots of canopy things we can do to to reduce that um, that, that 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 environmental effect to get to get that you know less moisture on those bunches. So um, it's again, one size is not going to fit all, but but understanding what what the key drivers this season can can inform what you need to pay attention to next year. Okay, great. Thank you, Cathy. Just um, continuing on um, from that, so there was some research that came out of New Zealand that showed that the use of undervine mulch can reduce botrytis levels in um, vineyards. Is that something that you've seen uh, in your travels or is it something that you recommend as, as a management practice? Um, I'd, I'd have to understand um, what the mode of action of that was, if it was altering the microclimate, for example. Um, but like, I think with all of these things, if you want to try something, I mean, Liz said, you know, try things, but if you want to try something, do it on a small area and, and just make sure you're comparing it with, uh, you know, doing it versus not doing it, because then you'll be able to answer that question for yourself. Because that might work in New Zealand under those conditions, but you just don't know if that's going to work at your particular site. So, um, but in terms of mechanism, I'm not I'm not sure exactly how that how that was working, unless others have got some thoughts on that. I think it was related to reducing the spore load from memory, but um, that's okay. Uh, so, a question for Warren. Um, just in regards to how um, you do your pest and disease assessment in the vineyard, there's a question about the mummified botrytis infections and whether these are included in the disease assessments or not. Um, and if they are, 
um, what your thoughts are about um, growers suggesting that they actually stay on the vine if um, the block is machine harvested um, as an argument for not including them. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. Um, really depends on how that harvest is performed. If it's done um, carefully and those mummified berries do remain on the bunches, yes, they can be excluded. But if they're at that point where they're going to fall off before the harvester or in the harvester or is hand picking going to be done and they get included or are they cut out of the bunches? It kind of depends on what is expected at the time of harvest and what gets delivered is how we do our assessment. Okay. Are there ways that you can set up the harvester to um, get rid of botrytis ahead of the harvester or, or reduce the amount that is collected by the harvester? Yeah, Liz had some really good suggestions, um, whether it was the dual harvest, whether it was um, uh, adjusting the beta speeds, um, fan speeds, um, onboard sorting. Um, there's lots of different ways and mechanisms to try and get a cleaner sample come harvest. Great, thank you. Um, and while we have you uh, speaking, can you just um, say a scenario where a um, grower comes to you and says they have a 1% botrytis severity in their block and they're um, three to four weeks away from harvest? Um, how would you, um, what advice would you give them? It kind of, um, kind of depends on, first of all, what sort of contract it is. I'm not going to go into the contract details, but um, is it an incidence-based contract or a severity-based contract? So each grower will have um, those specifications. Um, if it's 1% incidence, um, or I'll, I'll rephrase that, if it's 1% severity um, on 100% of the bunches, so 100% have got a very small amount, that can be treated completely different to 1% uh, uh, of the bunches being 100% infected. If it's um, that latter case, we can very easily drop 1% of the crop and machine harvest the 99 other bunches um, or percent of the other bunches. So um, it really depends on what levels of incidence and severity we find. Um, there are some really simple tools um, that we can use. And I'll give a bit of a plug for uh, PM app and Grape Assess here um, that are widely used to um, not to, to perform the, the assessment, but they're used to record the assessment. And you can monitor that with time um, and then assess it. Um, is it becoming more and more of a problem? And you then continue those uh, winery relationships, those com the communication to try and find out what options are available to, um, to the grower. Right, thank you. Um, so a question for probably for Cathy, how far away are we from using AI uh, in managing botrytis in the vineyard? So AI, artificial intelligence. Yeah, uh, uh, well, there's lots of sorts of AI, but probably the machine learning type. Um, look, the key limitation is, is having an automatic assessment of botrytis severity, because until people are willing to go out and do lot, uh, to routinely even just get a really uh, good assessment of botrytis at harvest, because all with, with the AI, it's simple correlations to, to weather conditions. So you need a really good data set, um, consistent standardised data set to be able to, 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 be able to do the machine learning. Um, and really uh, the ideal is doing the AI at your site. All, a lot of the predictions before have been sort of using regional data, but AI gives us, you know, if you've got the, the, the data at your site and, can, and it can keep learning. I don't, I don't think technically there's this, the AI itself is a limitation. It's actually being able to get, get the fast assessment of disease. Okay, great. And on a similar topic, um, Kath and Kerry from Treasury um, have uh, said that they're interested in your work on predicting the growth curve of botrytis. Is there a reference you can share or even better, is the mathematics readily available? Great question. Hi, Kath and Kerry. 
Um, so uh, again, uh, a lot of this data, it's not published. Um, a lot of the data is in New Zealand. Uh, Rob Beresford worked out there are, that there are about five different shapes that, that that curve can be. And so those five different shapes all have their own math mathematical relationship. Um, of course, if you, if you know how it's going, you can, you can probably guess what shape that's going to be. Um, it's probably a matter, again, if you're willing to do, it requires doing about ideally three, two or three botrytis assessments very early. So again, if you're willing to do the botrytis assessments manually, that's, that's all well and good. Um, it's, it's going to be amenable to autom automation. Um, so yes, look, I, I think that body of work can be done. It's just, uh, it's not published. It's, it's doable. It's not hard math. If you can find a mathematician and we can, you know, there is potentially a small project there that could be done. Um, so I guess following on from that, um, Cathy, um, back in New Zealand, um, uh, quite a few years ago, they were um, looking at a botrytis prediction or modelling um, tool that looked at whether conditions during the season, um, the phenology, and also you could put in um, the sprays that you had applied as well as monitoring information. Is this the sort of thing that you're talking about here with the botrytis modelling curves? So is that something that we could have in Australia for Australian conditions? So the modelling curves were, were, was a thing called late season botrytis decision support. And there was also another one we were involved in development of that as well called early season decision support. And the early season was more about uh, from flowering to, to mid season, getting a daily weather index. And I think I mentioned that, mentioned that before. Um, the early, the late season one hasn't been implemented anywhere as far as I know because of that problem of doing botrytis assessments. But the, I think the early season one is implemented in New Zealand. I, I haven't kept up to date with how, how that's going. We, for what, we've gone down various pathways here um, to look at how we could implement it here, but we just, we haven't found a way to sustainably implement that. Um, but these things cost money to deliver. It really needs to be done by a commercial provider. Um, and that commercialisation part just hasn't found a way. Um, there may be some other, there may be other apps out there that calculate weather-based indices, but you've always got to relate that, that back to your own particular site. So um, there's, a, there's still a lot of the interpretation of these things as well. Okay, thank you. Um, a question about group 11 fungicides. So are these uh, commonly used for botrytis control and are there any resistance issues in Australia? Uh, I think they're used where people are trying to cover everything with one base. That probably works in South Australia and the, and the lower risk regions. Um, I don't think there's too many people running with that up here, but I can't comment on other parts of the country. Warren might have a better handle on that. No. Okay, thank you. I will put you on the spot though, Warren. Do you have any local experience with biologicals? Uh, I did a, um, personally did a um, small lot trial um, a couple of years back, but it was far too hot and dry to really draw any conclusions from it. So um, uh, me personally, um, not really, no. Um, accolade wines, uh, definitely not, no. Um, we're really relying on the manufacturers and growers um, in these cases to actually give us some good guidance, some good information. Robin, can I just go back to the group 11s? Um, yeah. Sorry, I just had to make sure I was talking about the right group, the strobilurins. They're not tended to be used for botrytis control in grapes. Um, but the thing that you've got to recognise with resistance issues is that they're commonly sprayed for powdery. So if there's any botrytis around when they are sprayed, um, it will also act on the botrytis and potentially develop resistance. And there is known resistance to the strobilurins within botrytis. 
but it hasn't been a major issue in the viticulture industry because they're not traditionally used for botrytis. Great, thank you. Excellent um, explanation. Uh, so in New Zealand, they've had some success with running a harvester through to knock out bunch trash after flowering. Can anyone talk to that practice um, and its ability to reduce disease in Australia? Uh, I can't get people to do that. I just can't get them to do this harvester set up. They can't work out how to charge for it. It's all got too hard, which is a bit of a pity because I think it would actually make quite a difference up here. Warren, do you wanna? Um, thankfully, Accolade Wines has a New Zealand um, colleague. So, uh, and uh, yes, uh, it has been shown in New Zealand to give the equivalent of a decent fungicide application. Um, we are trialing it in several regions, several high pressure regions this season to see whether we can get it to work. Um, and early accounts say, yes, it's, it's probably doing some effect. Um, uh, ultimately, what it really is, is running a harvester over it post flowering to remove any uh, uh, aborted berries, um, flower caps that may still be residing in the bunch. Um, you're not actually beating the bunches, you're beating the, um, beating the trunk and the canopy and shaking it out um, underneath. So um, it is another harvest to pass, but when you get to this point in the season and you're trying to control um, botrytis, it can be quite effective. Great, thank you. Uh, so there's one last question. Uh, what is the general grower acceptance levels uh, of the value of biologicals for botrytis control? Is more education required? So. Yeah, look, I, I think we haven't done this rodeo prior to this season, to be really honest. You know, the, the pressure wasn't there. We had the things we used before, which were relatively inexpensive for the result we got. I think the barrier to people playing with these has been lack of understanding of how to integrate it into your spray program, not just your botrytis part of your spray program, but everything else you put out, you know, timing, return on investment. You know, every time I talk to, to the, the, the ad chem guys, they say, just do a bank zone spray. That's another pass, you know, and I don't have the time if I've got rain at day one and day six and day 12. So, so there's got to be education about how we mix things, both coppers, sulfurs, particularly if there's a lot of people going down this organic road at the moment. So, so they need a, you know, a kind of how-to guide of what they can do. Um, you know, there was a lot of value in, in understanding that things like Botector and sunscreen don't play well together. You know, it's, it's purely that you've got the sunscreen wanting to, to get into that space where the Botector is trying to grow. So we do, we need a lot more information. Um, and, and even with the biologicals, you know, like what order should I use them in? If I commit that I'm going to use three, you know, is it three of all of, of one product or should I actually be mixing them up? Which ones play better with, say, switch back or something else back at um, pre bunch closure? I think there's got to be a really open and transparent conversation for the best outcome for the longevity of all the products to manage your budget and to get your crop off. And, you know, that's... Everyone's got a commercial agenda in this, certainly from the ad chem end, which makes it harder, but we're all in this together, people. So if we could work together, and I think, um, you know, an offline forum probably garnering together some experience of the season would be really valuable, you know. Warren, you can... Yeah, no, I'd probably reinforce everything that you've said there. Um, historically, we've had Ipridion in the past, um, and that, that was um, taken out a few years back um, and we just haven't had the disease pressure more recently. Um, yes, I think there is an education required, but equally, how do we uh, optimise those biological applications to make sure that we are getting 100% activity on the vine as opposed to, oh, well, the sprayer wasn't quite set up right, we didn't quite clean it out, um, the nozzles were a little bit blocked. We didn't calibrate it right. We're getting poor coverage. What adjuvant can and can't we use? There's all these different topics that I think that we, we still need that education on. Um, and it's probably good that, um, you know, we can actually go back to some of the, the manufacturers and actually get those things um, sorted out. Um, 
probably not the year to be doing it, but we can get to the bottom of it. I, I think there's two steps. I think there's knowledge. We actually need some knowledge to then educate with. And I think we just need to be a bit careful there. Like we, there's stuff we need to know, but, but again, getting those basics right on sprayers, coverage, maintenance, all that just, it feels like a broken record. We talk about this all the time. It's probably a great year to start identifying what are those knowledge gaps that we still need to answer here and, you know, get some real priorities on those because, you know, if we, we, we still don't have, we've still got gaps in our knowledge, I think. Yeah. It's worth, but then again, I'm a researcher and <laughs> I've got a bit. No, but, but there's going to be a point sometime mid-year where people are going to come to me and to Warren and, and to Warren's equivalents and go, how much do you think industry is going to use next year? We need to forecast the make and we need to forecast how much to bring into Australia. The more we know about how they work and when we start to write spray programs, I don't write a spray program like, you know, a week out. I write a plan for the season that I adapt to the conditions. So I, I've got multiple Botrytis products and, and powdery products and downy products, making sure I manage resistance and timing and optimum control. But I need to know when to build them in. And I'm writing those programs in June and July, not the week that spraying starts. So, so if, they, if th that knowledge is important for us to be able to help them to, to work out how much product to bring into the country. And I think on the plus side too, with the modern suite of biologicals coming out, we do have a much better product to use. Um, even with some of the knowledge gaps than we did 10 or 15 years ago. So I think there's a lot of positives in the biologicals that are coming out. And I think once those knowledge gaps are answered and we can build them into a program, I think it, it's, it's, it's going to be shown to, have, to be worth it. Well, yeah, and, and maybe the next promotion that all these guys need to do is, you know, here's your discount fridge to store it. You know, that, you know <laughs> don't, don't give people more sunglasses or knives to open spray bags. Like, give them somewhere to store this stuff. Uh, there's just a comment that's popped up saying um, that we should speak to growers in Robe in South Australia who um, suffer from sea fog uh, and they've used biologicals in the last couple of years. Yeah, good to know. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Well, um, no more questions have come through. I think we've finally got to the, the end of them. Um, I really wanted to, well, we really wanted to thank you all so much for um, contributing to this webinar. You've been incredibly generous um, with your, your time. Um, thank you for sharing your experience and your, your knowledge um, so, so um, generously. Um, we also would like to acknowledge Bayer, so Damien Odgers, uh, BASF, Melissa Palvianen, I hope I've pronounced that right, and New Farm Scott um, Baton uh, for providing information um, for the presentation, uh, the slides at the end of Liz's presentation. Um, yeah, it's been a really, really great um, webinar. It's been excellent to have um, so many people on um, and the panel discussion at the end, I think has been really successful. So thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for all of the questions that they've sent through. Um, oh, we've just had a sneaky last minute question. What's the be best wetter to use? I think you're, um, you answered that, Barb. Talk to your rep, read the label. Um, it will vary depending on the, the product. Um, is that how you would answer it? What's the best product to use? No, what's the best wetter to use? Oh, no, I'm not going to enter in advising on wetters. You need to yep. speak. Need to speak to the people that that uh, have played that develop the product. They'll be able to tell you whether to use them or, or not to use them. Great, thank There's you. Too many out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to remind you that um, this webinar has been recorded, and a link um, to view the recording um, via the AWRI um, YouTube channel will be e emailed out to you shortly. Um, I'd li also like to acknowledge Wine Australia. They provide funding um, to allow these webinars to take place. 
and the next webinar in the series will happen after harvest, so on the 29th of April. So Dr. Anthony Borneman from the Australian Wine Research Institute will present the origin of Chardonnay clones with historical significance in Australia and California. So if you're interested, jump on the AWRI website and register. Um, look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you. And thank you again for our presenters. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.